All right, well, we cannot tell the story of John Knox without telling the story of Mary, Queen of Scots, because their lives are intertwined, and so I'm going to try to mix them together a little bit as we go along, and I want to think about his career in terms of, in some ways, the chapters of her life. And so, as we go along, I'm going to try to fill in, remind you of some of the things we've talked about, and see a little bit of what was happening there in Scotland. You recall the last time we were together, we had Knox born in about 1505. That's probably the safest date, although there's some difference of opinion along those lines. But it seems he was two or three years older than John Calvin. He grew up on the coast in Scotland, exposed to a fair amount of the tumultuous circumstances of the coast. There were invasions from time to time and other circumstances. He was a very bright uh, young man. He grew up on a farm. His father had a certain degree of wealth, but it was a peasant class situation. But he was given a decent education. The education was in anticipation of him becoming a priest, though he had no uh, really serious intentions of doing so. As you recall, he's usually referred to as Sir John Knox because even though he finished the educational regime, he didn't have the money to buy the diploma. And so that's how in Scotland the convention was exercised to recognize that. He was called Sir John Knox, and so that's the way we many times hear him referred to. We don't know what his view was exactly of the Reformation at this point. He was certainly aware of it. He was aware of the martyrdom of Patrick Hamilton, who was burned at the stake in 1538. He was working as a tutor in a home that seemed favorably inclined toward the Reformation, but Knox himself never gives us any significant insight into what exactly his own disposition was. Mary, Queen of Scots, was born in 1542. If you recall, we mentioned this last time we were talking about the career of Edward, and we were saying that Mary, Queen of Scots, was born five days before the death of her father. James V was married to Mary Guise, French nobility, and right at the very moment that Mary, Queen of Scots, was born, Henry VIII was attacking Scotland. He was attacking Scotland because James, his nephew, was refusing to join Henry in his break with the Pope. And, of course, Henry wanted lots of people in his corner on this. He had already broken from papal authority himself, and now he wanted Scotland to join up. And James, married to a strong Catholic, Mary Guise, aligned with France, said, no way. Henry attacked. It's called the Battle of Solway Moss. And in that battle, James V was killed. And so at five days old, Mary, Queen of Scots, became the Queen of Scots. She was a five-day-old princess. Queen. There was immediately a conflict that broke out in Scotland as to who would be managing the regency. Obviously, Mary couldn't rule herself, and so it was understood that a protector government would go into place. There was a pretty strong contingent of Protestant nobles, but also the strong Catholic tradition was there, and so it broke out into a kind of a minor civil conflict at that point over who would control the regency. But as it turned out, at least in the short term, the Protestants won and the House of Aaron, as it was called, took over and really was running Scotland, at least in a way that was favorable to the Reformation. In the spirit of that, there was an agreement made between the Regency in Scotland and Henry VIII that Edward VI, the son of Henry, would marry Mary, Queen of Scots. So when she was one year old, she was engaged to be married. And the marriage was supposed to take place when Edward was 10 years old. So he would, have, he would be a 10-year-old husband of a 4-year-old wife. And, of course, it was understood that that would be strictly a sort of technical marriage, not a robust, full marriage. But nevertheless, that was the agreement that was reached. Well, the Catholic forces in Scotland were not ready to abide that at all. The most powerful Catholic in Scotland at the time was a man by the name of Cardinal Beaton, and he actually engineered kidnapping Mary, Queen of Scots, and spiriting her away to some secret place. And that all took place right about this time frame. And as a result of that, Henry, incensed that now this engagement had been broken off, 
launched what is felicitously called the War of Rough Wooing. I mentioned this some weeks back, in which Henry is trying to woo, at the point of a sword, the Scots back into this arrangement between Mary, Queen of Scots, and his own son, Edward. Well, it was in that context, this civil conflict now, which was really sort of almost rising to the level of a civil war, supported on the one hand by Henry on the Protestant side, and of course by the entrenched Catholic forces there on the other hand, that a guy by the name of George Wishart returned to Scotland. Now, we talked about George Wishart briefly when we introduced the life of John Knox earlier. George Wishart had been a New Testament scholar teaching at St. Andrew's uh, there in uh, Scotland, and he was quite favorably disposed to the Reformation, and so he was teaching in the spirit of reading from the Greek New Testament and teaching the Greek New Testament in a way that really did highlight the deep insights that had been brought to the attention of the Christian world through people like Luther and Calvin. But it was at that time that Patrick Hamilton was burned at the stake. We mentioned him last time. He was another character at St. Andrews, who was very favorable to the Reformation. He was arrested and summarily executed, really in the middle of the night, and it became clear that there was no real freedom of speech at this point on religious you know, uh, grounds, and so Wishart felt that probably the better part of valor at this point was to head out the back door, which he did. And he fled Scotland in 1538, but he returned now in the midst of this civil conflict, feeling that this was a great moment when the Protestants seemed to be gaining ground with the support of Henry VIII, George Wishart, now much more solidified in his own understanding of things, returns to Scotland and now wants to take up the cause of the Reformation, and he did so by preaching. So probably the first great paradigm for preaching in the life of John Knox was George Wishart. He preached for three years up and down Scotland, north and south, up in the highlands, all through the place. He traveled around preaching a very strong, supportive message which was endorsing the Reformation and calling people to faith in Christ in terms that were familiar to those who were part of the Reformation movement. Knox was probably fully converted to his Reformation convictions by hearing the preaching of George Wishart. He became a close associate of George Wishart and at least for a time served as his bodyguard. And so one of the more famous images associated with John Knox is he's carrying a sword known as Sir John Knox and many people get the impression he was some sort of noble military guy but he was neither of them. He was a peasant he, and the name Sir I've explained to you and carrying the sword simply came from this time when he traveled along there with George Wishart at his bodyguard. But of course he heard him preach over and over and was deeply moved and really absorbed this kind of Reformation me message that was coming through this preacher. George Wishart's most famous time of ministry was at a little town called Dundee in Scotland which had been touched by the plague and the people in the city were more or less viewed as doomed. The city was put under quarantine, nobody could leave the city, and nobody could enter the city and, re and leave it again, you see, so it was kind of isolated, and the expectation was that everybody in that city sooner or later would die of the plague. The Catholic Church generally dismissed the city, didn't do much to provide ministry or otherwise care for them, but George Wishart famously went to that city several times, stood as close as he could along the perimeter there, and preached to the folks in the city, these people who were basically viewed as doomed and dying, and they would come, virtually the entire city would come, hanging on the words of this powerful preacher, George Wishart. The message he preached to them was one of comfort, one of hope, one of faith in Christ, one of trusting Christ in the midst of these circumstances that were so bleak, and the people gained great hope and great help and comfort in the midst of this very ghastly situation in which they were living. This made George Wishart famous across Scotland. He was viewed as a great hero, a great minister, because he was taking the time to preach to these people and to provide ministry to these folks who were otherwise being more or less dismissed and ignored. And so he became quite a well-known character, and his impact in Scotland was, was being felt at a very deep level. 
This was causing increasing concern among the Catholic forces in Scotland, and especially Cardinal Beaton. And so Cardinal Beaton hired a guy named the Earl of Bothwell to arrest George Wishart. For you history buffs, this is not the same Bothwell that eventually became the husband, one of the husbands, of Mary, Queen of Scots. Different Bothwell. That was Lord Bothwell. Later, we'll cover him eventually. But this is uh, nevertheless a guy who had uh, sort of, you know, police authority, you might say. And so he arrested Wishart, and Wishart was immediately put on trial. The prosecutor at the trial was Cardinal Beaton. The uh, uh, trial was well attended. It was a show trial. There was really no expectation that Wishart was going to get a fair trial, anything like due process. It was really more intended to be a public deterrent, to say, in effect, if you're going to follow this line, then this is the outcome that you're likely to face. And so the trial was very public, and as I say, Beaton was the prosecutor, but John Knox was there, and he took copious notes of the entire proceeding, which are really interesting to read. I won't go into much detail, but he tells one little story right at the beginning of the trial in which he says Cardinal Beaton was about to enter the courtroom and, um, uh, as the prosecutor, but there was another cardinal there as well from France. So two cardinals in their bright red regalia, you know. And so Beaton felt, of course, he should enter the courtroom first because he was the prosecutor and he was the leading Catholic authority in Scotland. But the visiting cardinal from France said, no, no, I should enter first because as a visiting cardinal, you should give me, you know, a little bit more prestige. John Knox tells the story in some detail, how it started as a polite conversation. After a while, it became a heated conversation, devolved finally into a pushing match. And finally, according to Knox, they grabbed each of them the crucifix that was around their necks and used it to beat on each other in a kind of sword fight. Now, this is John Knox, and he's not known to be, uh, you know, overly given to just uh, complete fabrication. So something like that must have happened. In any event, uh, it was sort of a commentary on the quality of the entire process, that you had that sort of egotistical fixation that was going on among those who were responsible for the dispensing of justice. In any event, Wishard was rather rapidly condemned, convicted, and burned at the stake publicly there, uh, just outside of, uh, of uh, St. Andrews. And so this hit Scotland like a shockwave because here's a man who was now widely respected among all of the Scots. Even those who were Catholic had a, an appreciation for the quality, for the integrity, for the devotion, for the apparent faith of this man, George Wishart. And even those who may not have liked him much otherwise still had some respect for him because of the career that he had pursued. As a result of this, Beaton himself met an unhappy end only a couple of months later. There were two Scottish nobles, one by the name of James Leslie, the other by the name of John Melville. There will be a test. <laughs> and these two Scottish nobles, Protestants, broke in in the middle of the night to St. Andrews, which is where Cardinal Beaton lived. They grabbed a servant there in the middle of the night who was conducting business in the hallway and said, where is the bedchamber of Cardinal Beaton? And this terrified servant didn't know for sure, but he sent them to the floor. And he said to them, watch for the door that opens and for Marion Ogilvy exiting, who was the mistress, to Cardinal Beaton. So the two went to that floor, waited in the shadows. Isn't this great? This is like made for movies, isn't it? And they're waiting in the shadows. And sure enough, Marion Ogilvy exits the door, the uh, room. They break in, there's the cardinal, and they kill him in his bed. I'm just the messenger, but it did happen. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that's happening. And obviously, there's a little bit of criminal activity on both sides here, for sure. But the Scottish people generally were quite enthusiastic about this because Cardinal Beaton had successfully created an image of himself that was universally despised, even among those who were otherwise Catholic. He just simply had turned the office of his Catholic responsibility into the most kind of degraded form of political 
ambition and motivation. So anyway, Cardinal Beaton was murdered, and immediately the Protestants seized control of St. Andrews. So that castle, which this is what it looks like today, it was much more bigger, you know, and so on at the time, but, uh, but they took over, and that became the headquarters in this continuing civil conflict and at times civil war between Catholics and Protestants in Scotland. This was sort of the center of the Protestant presence here at St. Andrews. Well, these Protestants, these nobles and others who were supporting them, who had taken over the St. Andrews Castle, immediately asked John Knox to become the official preacher for the folks who were living at St. Andrews. And John Knox was horrified at the prospect. He felt he didn't have anything of the proper training. He was certainly devoted to the Reformation, but he didn't believe he had the requisite understanding of things to really do this in a credible way. He felt awful that they were reaching what he viewed as the bottom of the barrel and asking someone like him, who had been nothing but a bodyguard, you know, up until this point, to become the official preacher to these folks who were in St. Andrews. They were very insistent, however, and so he asked for a few days to pray and fast and seek God's guidance in the matter. And so he retired to his private chambers, fasting and praying for several days, better part of a week. And at the end of that time, reluctantly and with great fear, he did agree to become the preacher. You would never know that he was fearful once he started preaching, because his sermons were the most powerful kind of scorched earth sermons you could possibly imagine. I think it's safe to say, my friends, we as Presbyterians would be horrified if the founder of the Presbyterian Church came back and preached a couple of sermons of First Presbyterian Church. I'm just saying, this man was a firebrand, you know, and his sermons were white hot. And he started his sermons preaching from Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, which if you're familiar with Daniel, you know, describes four great beasts and so on, and also highlights a character that is often viewed by many commentators as corresponding to the New Testament character known as the Antichrist. And Knox, with not the least apology, applied that to the Pope right there and then, and the entire kind of uh, Catholic edifice that he saw as responsible for so many crimes against uh, free conscience and freedom of religious expression and so on. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty robust kind of uh, uh, um, uh, sermonizing that he was responsible for, but it did uh, get him some attention. Mary Geese, who was still at least technically the regent, the mother, you know, of Mary, Queen of Scots at this point, who was still basically just a child, sees that things are going, that, that it's slipping away that the powerful effect of John Knox is rallying strong support for the Reformation there, and she sends an email in a panic to France and to all of her friends, her family and so on there, saying, you've got to come and help us. And so the French immediately launch a pretty good-sized military fleet across the channel there and uh, attack right on the coast where St. Andrews is located, and in fact, they actually lay siege to St. Andrews. And in July of 1547, that castle fell, and the people who were there, many of them were arrested or killed, but John Knox in particular was condemned to be a galley slave in a French galley, and it was known as the Nostradam. We'll talk about that in a moment. It was about the same time that Mary, now Queen of Scots, who's five years old, because of the sort of tumultuous circumstances, was sent back to France. So Mary, Queen of Scots, from the time she was five years old to the time she was about 12, or uh, I'm sorry, five years old to about 18 years old for 12 years, was in France. And about the same time that John Knox, of course, went off onto this experience. So this was a typical French galley The uh, 19 months, as I say, he was a galley slave. This was where people who were really condemned to die, this was like a death row uh, condemnation. 
The expectation was that with the miserable conditions, the food that was utterly inadequate, the disease processes that would, that would begin to take over, not to mention the exposure to the weather, there's no cover here. This wasn't like a Greek trireme where they had some kind of uh, protection from the elements. They were out there in the cold, the bitter of winter, and so on, and there was no protection whatsoever. So many of these people just didn't survive. And those who did, uh, just did it by you know, pure stubbornness, and that seems to have been what uh, was the case with uh, John Knox. He, John Knox was there on this French galley with a close friend of his, they had both been condemned at the same time, named John Balfour. And Knox later talks about and records some of his experience and some of his conversations, but by far the most memorable uh, and dramatic was when he and Balfour were having this conversation that Knox records uh, later, uh, where John Balfour asked uh, Knox, John, do you think we'll ever get out of here alive? John Knox replied, I, don't, I know the Lord will deliver us. Don't forget that Satan made Joseph go into Egypt, but God meant it for good to rescue his people. Don't lose hope, brother. God is faithful, we will return to our homeland, and God will give us the victory. At that very moment, they were passing by St. Andrews, out in the ship, the place where Knox had once preached. And Balfour, straining his neck to look up over the uh, edge of the boat there, said, Look ashore, can you tell where we are? And Knox famously replied, Yes, I know it well. For I see the steeple of that place where God first opened my mouth in public to his glory. And I know no matter how weak I am now, that I shall not die until I shall glorify his godly name there again. And so it seems that even when Knox was with no, certainly external evidence to support his opinion, in these dire circumstances he still had some deep sense that God was going to rescue him somehow or other. How it could happen was beyond anybody's imagination. Well this is what was happening now in 1548. As I say, Mary is five years old, Knox is going to be in a protracted exile that begins with this experience there on the Nostra Dame. Mary, as I say, spent 12 years in France becoming French. She loved France. She liked everything about France, and it made her very much dislike Scotland, which became increasingly to her a memory of having lived back in the hinterland, the outback, you know. And now she was here in the opulence and the loveliness and the beauty of the very upper, upper crust of the French way of life, and she just drank it in, along, of course, with the Catholic religion, which was very much just part of the DNA of the French nobility at that time. And so that's where Mary is for the next 12 years, and we're going to leave her there till she comes back a little bit later, but that's what she looked like apparently at about 13. Same time, of course, Knox is a galley slave, 19 months. However, in a surprise, he was released in a prisoner exchange in February of 1549. The reason this happened was because Henry VIII died in 1547. And of course his son, Edward, the son by Jane Seymour, became the 10-year-old king in England. And the protector government, you recall, was the Duke of Somerset, who was Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, the brother of Jane Seymour. He was a strong Protestant. And so during this relatively short chapter of English history, all of the people that were in power were doing their very best to lead England in the direction of the Protestant Reformation. Edward Seymour was very much aware of John Knox. He was already something of a famous guy, and he knew that he was condemned somewhere on some French galley. And he went to considerable time and effort to locate exactly where was John Knox, and he made a lavish offer to the French in the form of a prisoner exchange and other inducements that they would release John Knox and a couple of others in exchange for all of this quid pro quo that he was putting on the table, and it worked. Seymour was appalled when he saw John Knox for the first time, broken in health, emaciated, uh, his uh, diseased, 
uh, exposed to the weather, all of these, it looked like a man who was on death's door. And there was, in fact, some concern, even though Knox had been rescued, whether he would still even survive. But anyway, for the next several months, he was given the best medical care that was available in England at that time, and over about a six to eight month period, was able to regain his health and a little bit of his robust personality, so much so that he became the court preacher. And so we mentioned that when we were talking about Edward some weeks back, and this is the moment now when John Knox, having recovered his health to some degree, has this new opportunity to preach. Knox was never in good health from this point on, and he always attributed it to the experience on that galley. He was always a frail health. He couldn't, he couldn't, he had a, a, a stomach that wouldn't hold food very well. He was always kind of emaciated looking. Uh, but anyway, you know, it was, uh, he was, he was, uh, did the best he could. I, it always reminds me of Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh. I'm sure that that's how John Knox felt as the years ensued, that he felt, how much more could I do if I just felt good, you know? But uh, in any event, uh, he did get back sufficient health to become the court preacher. So for about three years, he is the court preacher, preaching to all of those who are part of the immediate uh, administration there of the king in England. <clears throat> and um, who knows what history would have told as a story except that. Um, Mary Tudor, of course, became the queen in 1553. So Edward VI, who was still just a teenager, dies. He was never in very good health. And this change, this regime change, was going to be, of course, profound and affect virtually everybody in England. So here's Mary Tudor, uh, later referred to, of course, as you know, as Bloody Mary. She launches a persecution against Protestant people in England, and many fled, and among them was John Knox himself. We told the story of the so-called Oxford martyrs, Latimer, Ridley, and Cramner uh, some time back. But, uh, and Knox probably would have been one of them, but he was able to get out the back door. And he goes to the continent. So he's going to go to a refugee city under the control of those in the Reformation and hide out there at least for a time. He went to Geneva. He arrived in Geneva in 1554. This is a time when Calvin was in a very complicated moment. We talked about the execution of Michael Servetus. We talked about that earlier. This is about the time that was happening. Uh, the entire city was sort of uh, up for grabs at this point because of the tumultuous sort of uh, press that was being associated with this entire process. Calvin was trying to stay out of it. I've talked about that in some detail on another occasion. But the point is Calvin's plate was pretty full at this moment. And even though Knox was hoping to have some kind of closer association with and conversation with Calvin, it really didn't happen at that point. Calvin did meet him, gave him to some of his finest associates, and what Knox had for them were the most thorny, pointed political questions you can imagine. Because his vision was a vision for Scotland. And he wanted to know if we're going to turn Scotland into a country that embraces the political outlook that is the implication of the Reformation, then what would that look like? Geneva was not a country, it was a city-state and it certainly bore the imprint of a Calvinistic theory of government. But it was a very different thing to think about transforming an entire country and not just a city. You see, the implications were much broader and it took a lot more kind of political architecture to think through what that would look like. And that's what Knox wanted to know because that was the vision he had for Scotland. And so he asked these very pointed questions and these folks gave him the very best answers they could. But at the same time, obviously, Knox had to do a, lot, a, little, uh, a certain amount of the uh, original thinking on his own. He returned for a few months in 1556 to Scotland. This was time, still a time when Scottish uh, culture was in kind of a tumultuous circumstance. But he preached in Scotland and under protection, of course, of the Protestant forces there and was able to persuade a significant number of the Scottish nobles to enter into what was called a covenant, which would, among other things, quote, establish the most blessed word of God and his congregation in Scotland. This is really the beginning of what came to be called the covenanters in Scotland that we'll talk about as time goes on. But this is sort of the beginning of this, where they enter this covenant, which is both theological but also political. 
Uh, it was still kind of too hot in the kitchen for, Scott, uh, for Knox, and so he went back to Geneva. And at this point, 1557, Calvin had more leisure. And he formed a fast and close friendship with Knox, and the two of them became very, very good friends over the next couple of years. This was the occasion when Knox made the comment, quote, Geneva is the most perfect school of Christ on earth since the days of the apostles. And that really was his impression. And he wanted to recreate, of course, to some degree, that school of Christ in Scotland to the degree that he was able to do so. In 1558, Mary, Queen of Scots, married the Dauphin of France, Francis II, heir to the throne. His father, Henry, was ruling at the time. So Mary, Queen of Scots, at that point, is in a position to be not simply the Queen of the Scots, but also, by way of her marriage, uh, the Queen of France as well. And so that takes place in 1558. Probably one of the most uh, interesting, uh, controversial, but um, it's a fact of his life, uh, aspects of Knox's Knox, uh, career was the publication at this time, 1558, of a little tract that was called The First Blast of the Trumpet. And if you can't make out the rest of it, I will just go ahead and read it for you. The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regimen of Women. <laughs> Probably wouldn't meet contemporary political correctness as standards, but... Uh, what was this? Every experience Knox had had up until this point with female rulers had been a decidedly negative one. And he had it very clearly in his mind that women should not be running countries. Okay? Now, I'm just reporting this, okay? so just don't shoot the messenger, but he wrote this. Now, the word monstrous here is a little misleading because in that at that moment in history, in the English language, monstrous didn't mean a monster, it meant unnatural, that would be it. So it'd be more the idea of the unnatural rule of women. He was, so the, the title is more inflammatory than it deserves to be, but it still was, a, you know, it was a diatribe against female leaders. And I think it was driven partly by his reasoning on biblical texts and partly by his personal experience with people like Mary Tudor and Mary Geese and others that he was familiar with. Unfortunately for Knox, it was only about five months later that Queen Elizabeth ascended the throne in England, who probably would have been one of Knox's greatest cheerleaders, but she always resented that tract. And so, even though she did support Knox, and in fact, Knox was very much, I, I don't know, I'm, honestly, I don't know if Knox later kind of regretted, you know, because as it turns out, Elizabeth became one of his most important allies. But if you know my, the sense of it, she always felt like she was doing it holding her nose a little bit because she was so resentful that Knox had written this tract against female leaders. And I wonder if Knox himself would have amended his view. I don't know. I, this is not an informed speculation at all. I'm just saying it did kind of change his views a little bit. He was very appreciative of Elizabeth's support and did everything he could to build bridges with her in spite of his earlier diatribe against female leaders. So anyway, uh, Scott, uh, Knox returned to Scotland in May of 1559. This is actually in a wax museum. I think it does rather capture probably the uh, typical posture of Knox as he would uh, preach. He was a powerful preacher and as he returned to Scotland at this point, uh, this begins the next chapter of our narrative of Knox. This is when Mary, Queen of Scots, and John Knox are both in Scotland, and they have this very interesting, rather tense, intriguing relationship that, that proceeds over about an eight-year period of time. And uh, it ends, of course, when Mary, Queen of Scots, is forced to abdicate the throne, and that's when, in many ways, Inc or, uh, Scotland really moves more uh, completely in a reform direction. I'm going to save conversation about this till next week because this is a good time to just uh, uh, call it uh, quits for today. But let me uh, remind you once again then of this text that we read and remind you of Knox's experience in a French galley and ask you at least uh, to some degree ask yourself when you've ever had these feelings. <clears throat>
Knox is sitting there rowing in a French galley exposed to the weather and he's reciting these words to himself. My days pass away like smoke. My bones burn like a furnace. I think Knox had in his mind the experience of Joseph, and of course he mentions that directly, who probably felt very much the same way. He'd never read this psalm, but he felt the very same way. There in a prison, falsely accused, trapped. The future appears to be bleak at best. My heart is stricken and withered like grass. I am too wasted to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my skin. And the description goes on in the most graphic terms. And I want you to know that at the very moment that Knox could say those kinds of things about his condition, God had so much more striking plans for him. There's a verse that Paul gives us, of course, over in Ephesians. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. It's quite a string of descriptions, isn't it? And I think in the case of John Knox, that would be precisely what he would have said if you could have given him a little snapshot of the long-term impact that his life would have sitting there as a galley slave. So when have you felt that way in your life? Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe you have, maybe you will. But we must cling to the great truth that God sometimes puts us in that Joseph situation or puts us in that French galley or puts us in a place where we feel like all is lost. Nobody's listening to me. I have nothing to say. There's no future prospects that have any credibility. I'm done, washed up, tossed away. You ever felt that way? You remember John Knox, and you remember that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think according to what? His riches in Christ Jesus. Knox learned it. We learn it. God's people have learned it through history, and it's one of the great lessons to which we can all cling with joy.